Imagine what it must be like to float in space, alone in the darkness, knowing that you're gonna die. Do you think you could at the very least come to terms with it? Come to terms with the fact that your days on Earth are over? That the darkness, the endless void, will be your grave? It's a terrifying thought, a demise drawn out across time and space, but what if it was the opposite? Would it be better to walk clueless into the void, to not know that today is your last day? You have your plans, tomorrow for example, you're gonna go to the gym, work out a little bit, and then you're going to see your family. You haven't seen them for a long time, so you're a little nervous, but you love them. But you never go to the gym, you never get to see your family again, because somewhere along the way you ended up at the end of a knife. Maybe you were going to see your boyfriend and decided to hitchhike to his place, but the stranger that so kindly had picked you up had something inside of him. Call it whatever you want, an infection, a disease, a mental disorder or just pure evil. Whatever label you put on it, it won't save your life when you meet him. He strikes, he stabs, he slashes your throat and then leaves your body to be found. Now, when these things happen, it's sudden. It's a tragedy and it's so unnecessary. But the man or the occasional woman responsible is usually caught, brought to justice somehow. But sometimes there is no justice. Sometimes the monsters remain in the dark. They live their lives among the rest of us. There are many examples of these things. The Golden State Killer, for example, wasn't caught for many, many years. He was an old man when he was finally exposed to the public. The best example is probably Jack the Ripper, a legend in a way. I don't know why Saucy Jack of all people became the cover boy for serial killers. I mean Ted Bundy was extremely prolific, you can actually learn a lot about serial killers from just studying him, but Jack the Ripper is different. Because he remained a shadow, he got away with murder and terror. There are many serial killers that remain in the darkness. Covering them can be a bit of a chore, because any case I cover is in a way a story. It has a beginning, it has a middle and an end. The unsolved ones only have a middle. We don't know how or why it started, it just begins with a bang, a corpse. And it ends the same way, a murder and then silence, without conclusions. But these stories are still worth telling. One of the stories have fallen into the background in many ways, it doesn't have the same attention that others have, but it's very compelling. I don't know his name, but I do know what they called him back then. They called him the Connecticut River Valley Killer. It all began with Kathy Milliken. Kathy was an avid bird watcher, and it was in October of 1978 that a friend of hers had told her about some rarely seen ducks that could be spotted out by Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve in New London, New Hampshire. She had parked her car on the small parking lot and gone out to her spot, but someone else was there too, someone with bad intentions. 
As I stated earlier, the case remains unsolved, so there is certainly uncertainties in the events that unfolded next, but the scene that was left behind tells us a lot of the story and about what happened to 26 years old Kathy Milliken that October afternoon in 1978. Someone had been waiting for her. There were several paths that led from her spot to the parking lot, but there was one spot along the trail that the killer knew would have been inevitable to pass, which would suggest that he was at least familiar with the area. There he stood waiting, and there is where he cornered her, cut off her path to her car. All she could do was run back into the forest. Her killer had dragged her along the path. While he was doing so, he had stabbed her. She had several stab wounds in her lower abdomen and three deep wounds in her neck. It was a haunting scene for the police officers to find. She had been stuffed away in the bushes by the trail, her skirt had been pulled down, and the rest of her clothes had been stuffed beneath her. The police officers could reconstruct the scene in front of them. A trail of car keys, binoculars, and strands of hair led from the spot where he had been waiting to strike her all the way to where her body had been dumped. This murder would be the first in a long series. No one knew it then, but the Connecticut River Valley killer had just begun his reign of terror, leaving nothing but a ghostly sketch and a trail of dead bodies behind. It's unsure if he killed more than those known victims. Even some of the known victims haven't been definitively tied to the Valley Killer. The odd thing about the Valley Killer is the lack of sexual assault. Kathy was found partially nude and with her skirt pulled down, but there was no evidence of rape. Maybe he just came in his pants out of pure excitement, or maybe he saved the memories of his brutal murders in his head to pleasure himself to later, or maybe it wasn't about sex. Maybe it was just a hatred, a need to degrade and humiliate women in the most gruesome and sadistic way possible. I can speculate all day long, but it doesn't change the fact that the case of the River Valley Killer is cold as ice. The events that unfolded between 1978 and 1988 is set in stone, and Kathy Milliken was just the beginning. Three years passed by, then the Valley Killer struck again. This time it was a 25-year-old woman named Elizabeth Critchley. She had been hitchhiking along the interstate highway and had last been seen in Massachusetts. It was in the late summer of 1981 that her body was identified. She was fully clothed when they found her and she had rings on her fingers, but it had been a chore finding out her identity. It actually took them two weeks to find out who she was, but Elizabeth Critchley sticks out from the other victims. Her cause of death wasn't determined, but it was listed as a homicide. There were no stab wounds on her body, and her corpse was found in the hunting grounds of serial killer Gerard Schaefer, although Gerard denied ever picking Elizabeth up. Her death is a mystery. I'm not sure why it was listed as a homicide, but something must have told police that she had been murdered. Maybe the way she had been found or defensive wounds. Not far from where Elizabeth had been was another dumping ground. This one with stronger ties to the Valley Killer, Maybe that's the only tie they had, or maybe not. The woman found murdered close to the spot where Elizabeth had been found was Eva Morse. But I want to do this in a chronological order, as to not make things too messy. So we will come back to Eva Morse later. Just like after the murder of Kathy, three years went by. And it's worth to mention that none of these victims would be tied to each other for a while. They seemed like isolated incidents for now, but in 1984, the Valley Killer would step up his game, killing two women in the span of a few months. No one saw him coming. Bernice Cortenmanch had been missing for a long time. It was in 1984 that she disappeared. She was going to hitchhike to her boyfriend's house, but she was never seen again. Her parents were heartbroken, she was only 17, and time went by. It was only four days before the nuclear incident in Chernobyl, April 22, 1986, that a set of teeth found on the skeletal remains of a young girl found in the woods was matched to Bernice. It had taken two years of uncertainty and sleepless nights before her parents got the news. She had been dead all along. She had been laying in the woods for one year and ten months. There was only bones left when they found her, 
it was clear that something had happened to her. It's hard to determine a cause of death on a skeleton, but she had been stabbed. There were small nicks on her neck, and with that the connection to the MO of the Valley Killer had been made. Just like with his other victims, those of the past and those of the future, the victim had been stabbed to death, and the victim had specifically been stabbed in the neck and then dumped among the trees and bushes. Some of them were found quickly. Bernice Cortenmanch had almost began sinking into the forest floor when she was found, but there was the skeletal remains of another woman that would make detectives take a closer look at the string of murders that was haunting the Connecticut River Valley. Again, that connection was Eva Morris. Her remains was found on April 25th, 1986, and just like Bernice, she had been laying there for a while, almost for a year. But again, I have to divert attention, because Eva Morris wasn't the Valley Killer's fourth victim. His fourth victim was L.M. Freed. Just like his previous victim, L.M. Freed was laying in the woods for a long time. She was a nurse at a local hospital, and one day she just vanished. They searched with helicopter and they searched intensely, but she was just gone. But she wasn't really. She was dead, her body decomposing just like Bernice had, and just like Eva would. She was found on September 19, 1985, a year after her disappearance. The only trace they had found in the summer of 84 was Ellen's car, abandoned by the side of the road, the doors locked. Now, we get to Eva Moore's. Just like the others, she had just disappeared. It was on July 10th, 1985 that she went missing, last spotted hitchhiking outside a veterinarian clinic. Something that Eva shared with some of the other victims was her occupation. She was a nurse, I'm not sure if that played any part in her demise, but it's at least worth noting. Her remains were found on April 25, 1986, around the same time that the other remains were found. She was found by a logger in the woods of New Hampshire, it wasn't far away from where she had last been seen alive hitchhiking, and it wasn't far away from where the remains of Elizabeth Critchley had been found. The connection to the first murder hadn't been made yet, but something was clearly going on. Several remains found within a short time frame, all of them disappeared under similar circumstances. It appeared as if the Connecticut River Valley had a serial killer on their hands. Someone who preyed on lonely women hitchhiking along the roads in Vermont and New Hampshire, Eva Morris did die that day, on July 10, 1985. The River Valley Killer had been lucky so far. Most of his victims had been nothing but skeletons when they were found. Any trails he could have left behind had withered away. He was inactive for almost an entire year after the murder of Eva Morris, but in May of 1986 he was back. This time he took a different approach. It was Linda Moore that became his next victim. He had broken into her home and caught her between the kitchen and the living room. He had cornered her in a similar way to how Kathy Milliken had been cornered in the woods eight years earlier. What followed was brutal, a frenzy. The intruder had no interest in valuables or possessions that night. All he wanted was to act out his violent fantasies. As he cornered her, he attacked. He stabbed her with a knife, methodically and almost machine-like. She put up her arms in defense, but he would just stab through them. He was like a wild animal with a knife. Linda Moore tried. She really did. She fought her attacker, but she couldn't stop the inevitable. The River Valley Killer had claimed yet another victim, and this time he had left a bloodbath behind. She had been stabbed many, many times, almost as if her killer had been in a panic, but there was no hesitation, just determination. This home invasion attack had been carried out about a week and a half after the skeletons had been found. Maybe this angered him, and maybe this motivated him to change his approach, to not fall into a detectable pattern. Whatever it was, it seemed to have calmed him, because it wasn't until March of 1987 that he struck again. The disappearance of Barbara Agnew was odd. She was a 36-year-old woman who had been spending a couple of days up in Stratton skiing. On March 28, 1987, Barbara was driving her car on a very snowy road. She had to go to the toilet badly, so she stopped at a rest stop and went in. What happened next is unsure. The next person to arrive on the restroom found Barbara's car, 
empty, still part and splashes of blood in the snow. Something was clearly wrong, and so a search began. The disappearance of Barbara had indicated foul play from the very start. This unnerved the people in the area. They started buying guns and preparing for the worst. Two months went by, and then she was found. She had clearly suffered a horrible fate. She had been stabbed several times. She had been dragged into the forest, and the cause of her death, just like with the others, were a severed throat. The killer had stabbed her in the neck. But before that, he had stabbed her in her abdomen, several times. It didn't matter how much he fought back. Her killer had attacked her in that rest stop. No one knows if he had been following her, but honestly, if you want to know my personal opinion, I think he just came upon an opportunity. A lonely female, not another human being for miles. I think he acted on impulse with her. He clearly had an issue with his violent tendencies, it seems like he barely could hold on to his self-control. Because once he opened the cage, the River Valley killer stepped out, and he was a mean motherfucker. This is where his trail of corpses end though, with Barbara. He had one more victim on April 6, 1988, her name was Jane Borowski, but she survived. She seems to have been the only one who managed to outlive the burst of violence thrown at her. Jane was 23 years old at the time, and she was 7 months pregnant. She had stopped to get something from a vending machine when a man approached her. He seemed a little weird, but his weirdness was the least of her issues that night. She walked back to her car, and as she opened her door, the man lunged at her. He was telling her that she had hurt his girlfriend. That didn't make any sense really, it was probably just a way for him to confuse the motive in case the victim survived. The man was in a frenzy. He stabbed Jane Borowski 27 times and once he finally stopped, she was laying in a pool of her blood, seemingly dying, so he left her thinking that the job he had started was finished. But it wasn't. Jane was a fighter, she wasn't going to die. She crawled back into her car and began driving to her friend's house for help. The creepy thing though was that she realized on the way that the man that had attacked her was driving in front of her. She remained calm and managed to get to her friend's house and get help. The attacker and his car stopped to observe for a little while and then he drove off. He drove off not only from Jane Borowski and the biggest trauma of her life, but he also drove off into the darkness. And whoever he was, he was never seen again. Maybe he's still out there, maybe he's dead by now, who knows. Before I move forward, I need to move back. There is something I didn't tell you about. A potential victim, a case that shook the citizens of Claremont and Charlestown. It was a 15 year old girl named Joanne Dunham. She was tall, blonde hair and blue eyes. In 1968, an entire decade before Kathy Milliken, she had disappeared. It only took searchers one day to find her corpse. She had been dumped in the woods, cause of death determined to be strangulation. A tragedy, and her killer was never caught. The odd thing about Joanne Dunham though, is where she was found. She had been dumped very closely to where Eva Morris had been dumped. Had her death occurred a decade and a half later, it surely would have been tied in with the others. Joanne wasn't stabbed to death, but if she was the River Valley killer's first victim, it's very possible that he killed her in another way. He hadn't established his MO just yet. There isn't much more to say about her. There is a geographical connection to the other victims, and just like the others, she seemed to just have disappeared, been picked up by an unknown man. She had been murdered and dumped in the woods, the same woods that the skeletal remains of other murder victims would be found years later. What do you think? I suppose you want to hear about suspects. Well, I have to admit, the theorizing of suspects is probably my least favorite part of covering these cases. There is always so many of them, so many that are ridiculous, and there is always someone suggesting the Zodiac Killer is responsible. There is always someone tying the fucking Zodiac Killer to every unsolved case out there. But there was one man who stood out of the others. Michael Nicolau. He had murdered two of his wives and committed suicide in Florida in 2005. He had been living in Massachusetts at the time of the murders and had family living in Vermont. An attempt to prove his involvement with DNA was inconclusive. I'm not sure if that means he is exonerated, but there is several holes in the narrative as well. For example, he was living in Virginia when Eva Morris disappeared. There was another guy named Bordeaux, 
a karate teacher with an imaginary friend who liked to look in the young girls' locker rooms at the YMCA, and many more like that. If you want to get very deep into the case of the River Valley Killer, I suggest you read the book The Shadow of Death. That's where 99% of the info for this episode came from. I like it when there is an entire book worth of material to work with. It's like a buffet. There's just too much to cover in a visual and auditory medium like this. That's the story I had for you today. And I never thank you for getting me to 1000 subscribers. I guess the next milestone is 5000 subscribers. But I don't want to obsess over the numbers. I'm just gonna do my thing and let it grow. The Connecticut River Valley Killer is chilling in many ways. I mean, not only did he get away with it, he was so vicious in how he attacked and it seemed to be just out of pure hatred, not sexual. But I don't know what his motives were though. No one really knows except for him. Hopefully one day we will learn the full story, the beginning and end only a name can offer us. He disappeared into the void just as he had entered, with a burst of violence. And he left eight corpses behind him, or maybe seven, we just don't know. But we do know that he existed. We know he was there and we know he was praying. Sadly, that's probably all we'll ever know.